Welcome to the Haunted Hacker Podcast New Year's Day edition with my buddy Chris. Um, we'll just call this uh, Chris Roberts Part 2. And uh, today we're going to talk about what happened last year, what's going on this year, predictions, um, and just the craziness that ensues. Chris, it's awesome to have you on, uh, as usual. And, yeah, uh, thanks again, Mike. Appreciate it. Absolutely, man. I'm I'm glad that you're uh, you're safe from the from the fires in Colorado and you know Mother Nature. That's really cool that uh, you weren't harmed or your property wasn't damaged, which is good. Yeah, I, we got lucky. I mean, unfortunately, you know, I think there's what a thousand or so houses and a bunch, a whole bunch of businesses, and yeah, you know, I think probably like everybody in Colorado, almost you know, we know of a few people who are. Uh, who are uh, who got hit and who lost hands? There's a couple of folks at the barns, a couple of people, friends in the business. It just sucks. I mean, it's you know, it's it's we're already seeing supply chain issues. You know, like right. one of the issues even in our industry, but you're seeing supply chain issues in the building and and that side of the industry. And now you just added an extra thousand homes that need to be rebuilt and you know, hundred plus businesses or whatever. And it's it's uh, it's going to suck. It, it's just, it is what it is, unfortunately. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, like the lumber costs, like I know a couple people building houses and, and the lumber shortage, and lumber costs are just through the roof, which I don't understand. So the whole supply chain issue that we had this year or this past year, man, you know, to be honest with you, it almost feels like they were using that as an excuse to hike prices. Because when you look at the whole big picture and, and you know, the, the gas issues and, and oil issues and, and everything in the store going at tenfold. Someone's profiting off of that. And I, oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I hate to think this, but part of me think it's part of me thinks it's contrived, you know, that, you know, we didn't have a true supply chain issue and it was more of a, let's see how high we can crank the prices up at the end of the year. I think it depends what it is. You know, I, th I think it, it really depends what we're talking about. And a perfect example, let's go back to the very first like year of quarantining shenanigans mm -hmm. when toilet paper for crying out loud. I mean, of all the things that almost brought down society, not just, not just you know, a little freaking toilet paper takes down almost takes down governments and humanities you know first world countries i mean the folks in the second and third world countries who are sitting there going well, I don't know what the hell are y'all talking about we use one piece and we peel off a corner and off we go kind of like mountain climbing toilet paper usage um but uh i mean that was that was huge and that actually was to some degree partially supply chain and then you just had humans humans being humans and Instead of going out and buying a, a packet, you go out and buy 10 packets and you put six of them up on Craigslist and, and hoard the others. I mean, it's just, I hate humans. I, I, my father, unfortunately, my father was, was fairly racist. You know, it's one of those things. I learned a lot from my father about how not necessarily to be. And, and his excuses for being fairly racist was that he was part of the Live Aid. So when Live Aid happened back in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, 86, wherever it was, when Live Aid happened, he was part of the Royal Air Force and they would go over and they were doing all the famine drops and they would sing it. And in, in his mind, he was like, well, you know, the, those folks with the colored skins, they don't care for their fellow humans and terrible people. They, they take everything and then they disappear and leave the rest of the village and try to, to suffer. And I'm like, you know, and I remember those words echoing in my ears as, you know, as the years go on. And we saw how everybody with white skin was doing the same thing. And it didn't matter the color of the freaking skin. It's humans. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I, I was in London when um, the first pandemic or plague hit. And uh, I remember going to Tesco and no toilet paper, no milk, and no flour. Yeah. And I thought, hey, I mean, come on, like... Staying in line to get into Tesco, it took us an hour to get into Tesco. And then once you get there, there's nothing there. There's nothing left. It just it yeah. drove me insane. Um, yeah. But now we're seeing that with COVID tests. Yes. You, know, you go to Walgreens yeah. and, oh, there's no COVID test. We finally found a CVS had COVID test. Um, 
but now they're saying, well, we're not so sure those are, those are hundred percent accurate with Omicron. Um, they had uh, a guy. Out- yeah. Yeah. It's been some of the statistics on it. And well, and here's the other problem, this information dissemination. I mean, yes. we, again, back to our industry, mm. it's terrible enough in our industry sometimes mm. to understand what the point of origin of a piece of data was, let alone whether you can still trust and validate the damn thing once it's safely been sent between you and I. But now in the real world, we're seeing the same thing. On one hand, you see people like, well, this test is x man percentage this is this you've got unfortunately the cdc is not exactly having its finest moments when it comes to being able to <sighs> get to the truth of matters and and uh, it's it's frustrating as all heck it really is because we know that there are elements and levels of protection we know blah 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 blah, blah but we just don't know uh, we, half the time you don't know who the hell's telling the truth or what spins being put on it and then you know, it's like, then you go back and turn and say, well, okay, how many freaking people did you test this on? Oh, test subjects were 100. Hang on, there's 330 million people in this fucking country. Right. Y'all right. tested it on 100 and you're telling me it's only this percentage effective. Um, love you, but I think your sample size is a bit fucking small. Yeah, um, and math, math just doesn't add up. Oh, and it, gosh, no. it seems like numbers are hard for the government these days. Um, <laughs> I actually broke down and got Isn't that the, the truth like, for real, hundred <laughs> percent. I actually broke down and got the first COVID vaccination. I told myself I was not going to do it, um, so because of medical issues, issues I've mm-hmm. had in the past. Yeah, but I went and got it, and you know it was a Pfizer vaccination, and uh, I have to say that the side effects were were not minimal. Um, I definitely knew that I had the COVID jab, um, but didn't kill me either. And so, you know, that, that's a bonus in my world. Um, yeah. <laughs> but again, you know, the, the data coming from the government when it comes to the vaccination, you know, it, it's really hard for me to trust the government when they say anything, but it's even more difficult for me to trust them with something I'm going to put into my body. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough one. Uh, yeah. it, it's, you know, there, there is an argument to say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That, that's fine. Got it figured. I mean, I've, I've had both vaccines and the booster. And it's, it's less about trust and not trust. It, it's honestly, it's the consequences. Right. To me, the same thing. You know, there's things going on. We're getting older for crying out loud. The gray hair's there. What are the consequences? What are the consequences of testing of a vaccine? Well, it's a, it's a percentage, you know, and, and it's a small, small percentage. What's the probability of something happen if I catch it? Well, you know, it could be kind of worse. Okay, well, I'm going to take the lesser of two evils. I think at this point, it, it isn't really how effective is it? How good is it? What is it going to do? It's going to be which is the lesser of two evils. Right, right. And, and the problem is, is you've got people like, well, I caught it and I'm fine. Well, no, you're not, you numpty. They might be fine for this variant, but the other 64 that are coming at you between the eyes, it's kind of like flu. Right. You know, I got, got a horrible feeling this isn't like the flu vaccine. It's, it's a probability. It's like, well, there's 50 options and we can put three of them in the vaccine and we're going to toss a coin and hope for the best. Yeah. And, and really, you know, I've had it <laughs> three times. The first time I had it, um, I was in London. It was in uh, the hospital, Princess Alexandria Trust. And uh, it, was, uh, it was rough. It was really rough. Second time I had it was in Houston, which I was back in the hospital. Uh, so when Omicron came out, I thought, you know, there's going to be another variant. Obviously, yeah. it has. There has to be another variant. The the, the speed that it's it's transmitted now, it's going to mutate. Um, and my thought was, what are the chances of the next mutation being something very lethal? And I thought, you know, it, it very well could be. We don't know. Yeah, we just don't know. Not enough science behind it. So yeah, I, t- I took the risk, and to me, that was a big battle this year. Was you know with, with blood clotting problems. I thought, you know, am I going to do this and take a chance of getting a blood clot or am I going to pass on it? Yeah. Um, so I just took a chance and, and I think, you know, I'm going to go for the second shot here in a couple of weeks, but um, yeah, I mean, there's so many weird things that went on this year, you know, not just the continuation of the pandemic, but then when you look at in our industry and you look at the geopolitical tension between Cuba and U.S. and U.S. and and Russia and, you know, so on and so forth. And then you look at some of the attacks that we've had with the ransomware and and 
on the critical infrastructure. You know, I think we're being geared up for something more of a firecracker this year. I think the, the, the issues that we have with Russia and the issues that are going on with Cuba, I think are going to culminate into something a little bit bigger. What are your thoughts on that? I'm, you know, it's, it's a tough one because, uh, yeah, I mean, 2021 was definitely not our finest moment. Let's be perfectly honest on this one by any stretch of the imagination. Unfortunately, I don't see 20, 2022 being much different. Um, there are a lot of adversarial groups that have got a taste of the Bitcoin, that have got a taste of how easy it is to take us down. And actually, you know, it was interesting. I was sitting on a, a forum, one that I keep an eye on on a pretty regular basis, mm. and I'm watching Dubai and UAE getting its ass handed to it mm-hmm. by a whole bunch of stuff so you know we have concerns obviously about our about you know the u.s being attacked from you know take your pick of countries and yet i was actually looking at uae and just seeing how much they're getting nailed on a whole bunch of different things and we obviously know the tensions over in the middle east between the various different countries over there i think from a u.s standpoint you know to your point that the russian issues and the rhetoric there let alone over the holiday period, you know, you've got a massive physical presence build up along the Ukrainian border. So you've got a whole bunch of dick waving going on on both sides of the fence um, and posturing over who comes into NATO and who doesn't. So now you've got that. So now at that point, you have a lot of um, a lot of chest beating and flag waving. So now you've got a lot of the influences from there looking at the US going, what are you going to do about NATO? What's happening? A lot of it, European attacks. But then our, our friends over in the Far East are, are still doing some very, very interesting things. That, that's, and again, it's my, you know, it all breaks down to me, it's that long game, short game thing. Mm. The US really doesn't have, doesn't have it together right. when it comes to playing the long game. Well, it, I think part of that too is, you know, we're looking at countries that have had the same leader for 20 years, you know, mm-hmm. and, and we tend to switch off every four to eight years. Uh, and lately it hasn't been a good switch. Boy, they <laughs> tell me about it. I mean, well, and here's the other problem. I could accept the fact if the leader switched out every four to eight years, I actually yeah. wouldn't have a problem with that. Change of thought, change of ideas, but it's an abs- it's an upheaval. If you just went out there and said, hey, we're going to change the lead up, nah, no problem, get over it. But you go out there and you sweep everything. You, the Congress and the Senate, I mean, everybody gets, gets shifted out and a whole bunch of new bodies come in and their first priority isn't to the people. It's how do I make sure that I stay reelected because I'm in my comfy seat. I spent 20 years getting to my comfy seat. I'm in my comfy seat. How the heck do I maintain my comfy seat? Yep. And that's, that to me is, that's the challenge. You know, if we just swapped out the guy, in the, you know, if, in, if somebody went and knocked on the door in the old office and said, oi, numpty, actually get, put another body in. Let's have a different set of thoughts. Right. We could kind of deal with that. Yeah. I think the two-party system too is, is not, I don't think it's what we think it is or what we want it to be any longer. I think the two-party system is more of a facade of one corporation running an entire country benefiting profiting but i think they keep the facade of the two-party system to keep people divided because people united people in numbers is more of a threat than division i think yeah okay so devil's advocate job for a minute on this one Mm -hmm. i would actually be fine if if party a and party b if they said hey look um we don't, we don't, we don't like pick a pick a topic. You know, you're un-American if you drink if you drink tea. Party A says that. Party B goes, hey, you're un-American if you drink coffee. I'd be actually happy with that if they bloody well stuck to their guns. Yes, yes. If they didn't go, well, people are shifting around now, and everybody's starting to drink. Tea. Oh, well, you know, we'll accept tea people as well now. Like, no, y'all made your damn minds up you you stood up and said this is what we stand for you know we stand for teachers we stand for this we stand for education or we stand for profiteering or whatever i think again 
like our industry. You know, it, it's it's in, it's interesting how it mimics our industry. If if I actually got a sales message from somebody that said, "Hey, you know what? You're my twentieth call of the day." And, and I don't really expect you to get hold of me. And, and, and quite honestly, I'm sending this out by an automated system and I've sent out a hundred already and, you know, and I'm sending out another 50 or 60. So it'd be kind of okay if you get back to me, but if you don't, I kind of accept it. And uh, hey, it's end the quarter and I'm just trying to profit off of you. I, I'd I give him money. Respond. Yeah, I'd probably respond because at least there's honesty. Yeah. You know, at least I don't get the message going, hey, Chris, how's it going today? You're my special guy, and, <laughs> and I love you, and I think you're wonderful. Let's go out to dinner. No, you you want your hand in my damn pocket, and you want your other hand down my balls feeling me because you want to make sure that I keep paying you money for the next 12 months. Exactly, exactly. Stop bullshitting me. I, that, um, that and the certs, the, the, the blind certs. Hey, do you <sighs> want a cert? Which one do you want? <laughs> You know, okay, I haven't, maybe it's, maybe it's a block the ball or many of them. I haven't seen that. LinkedIn was, uh, unfortunately, was going through a huge phase of that for a while. And I'm, yeah. I haven't seen so many of those recently. Like, hey, you know, what cert would you like? Uh, either I'm becoming more selective or LinkedIn's finally managing to get their hands around some of those issues. I'm not sure where to, hopefully the latter. Yeah, I, I try to avoid those. I get, I get one or two now. But earlier this year, it was it was constant. Hey, my love. Oh. Yeah, no, this is Otis. This is the oh, that's Otis. This is the little buddy who, in less than twenty four hours' time, is losing his testicles because he's a year old and and he's starting to get to that point where he thinks he's dominant. <laughs> yeah, no, <Nice. laughs> he doesn't quite realize. He went in for blood work yesterday, and he's like, "I'm not sure about this." I'm like, oh, "Let's go for a pop car." He's like, "Oh, I'm good with this. I'll happily get in the car." I'm like, "Sucker." <laughs> Yeah, luckily my uh, lo my Loki is passed out. I think the cat oh, got to him. But we've been doing a podcast, and when he decides that he doesn't want me on a podcast, he will jump up and literally claw me and try to get on the computer. Yeah, so I I've had to lock him down, but I figured out that if I give the cat before the podcast, he knocks straight <laughs> out. So. Drug the cat. <laughs> yeah, so we're good. Yeah, so I get it. I totally get it. These guys, it's a little harder to drug them. This one's cute. He's um, he's a year old, but when he wants me, he'll actually put his paws up here and just lays across me and just wants attention. Okay. Milo comes over and he's bigger, and I'll be sitting here working. He puts his nose here and he just shoves his head. So I end up going <laughs> like this. Like, all right, I, I get the hint. I get the hint. So there was a movie that came out on Netflix. Uh, I want to say it was the later part of last year. Uh, it was very, very recent. Don't look up. Have you had a chance to watch that yet? No, I oh. saw the I saw the write up to it. I saw the write up. It looks interesting. If I remember rightly, it's two astronomers notice a, a world ending event, mm -hmm. try to tell the people about it, and apparently everybody's like, "Yeah, that's all I know." That's and that's just because I read the synopsis of it. Yeah, I, I won't. I won't spoil it for you, but there is a lot of events and people in that movie that you could replace what we have right now in government with those people, and it would be identical. And I think the media, <laughs> the media would play the same game <coughs> as they did in that movie. But you, oh, you wow. have to, you have to watch. It's very satirical, but Leonardo DiCaprio, jo Jonah Hill, oh. Meryl Streep. I mean, oh, can, it's got so it's got good people. Okay, then yeah, yeah. that'll uh, okay. I saw it and I'm like, this could go either or two ways. It could be really, really interesting, but it, yeah, all right, I might have to watch that in that case. It's, it's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic, um, and it, it reminds me of everything that we dread as human beings being played out in a realistic way, with the satire of our media and how they portray things. Yeah, and how the government takes sides based on media I mean, it, it, it's crazy it's absolutely crazy but i sat and watched it and i thought when i turned it on i thought you know either this is gonna really suck and i'm gonna waste my time or it's gonna be really funny but it was more than that it was it was more of an eye-opening film which i don't think it was meant to be but just looking at the events and looking at mankind today and the, the environment that we live in you know that it could it could happen any day. So we're, I mean, you think about what we're doing in our world. Mm. You know, uh, the, the, the technology, not that's here today, 
Mm-hmm. I was talking to somebody about this yesterday um, or last night, early this morning. Hey, take a break. Thank you. Uh, the technology that we are looking to advance in the next five to 10 years. Mm-hmm. And it goes beyond the stuff that we see in front of us. You know, we talk about embedded technology. We talk about technology. <clears throat> I mean, the stuff I'm messing around with, the systems behind me and that's in the other area, the technology that's looking at what we can do with brain signals and how we can manipulate and how at the moment we're taking them out. Well, you can take something out at some point in time, you're going to be able to flip that around and put it back in again. Right. So all of that is coming down the line. This isn't just theoretical stuff anymore. This is very practical stuff. We're already using it inside certain uh, applications. We'll just leave it at that for advancing and speed learning and all these other kind of wonderful things. So you look at that and you go, okay, this is where we're going. And you look at some of the other stuff and you're like, well, hang on. We still haven't been able to manage our current environments. We haven't been able to effectively secure them, let alone protect them, let alone reduce risks. We haven't been able to communicate to humans, standard, regular, normal, the other 7.5 and a half billion people on the planet, not only the benefits, but the risks of some of this technology. And yet we're marching towards the ability to literally manipulate humans. I'm like, uh, I don't like this. I mean, I'm not terrified of it to a point where I'm putting tin full on the hat, but the writing's on the wall and it ain't pretty. Right. We, we talked about that on a previous podcast. Uh, yeah. we, were, we were talking about Neuralink AI and is it a blessing? I guess it really depends on whose hands it's in, right? Totally you know, it, if it comes from science, scientists or, or MIT or, you know, Tesla. What, you know, we, we could probably fare pretty well, you yeah. know, but yeah. if the wrong people get a hold of that technology, which we know they will, yeah. it could be very detrimental to the whole human race. Not, not just a population, but the entire human race. It's, I mean, this is, this is that huge argument. And again, I come at it from somewhat of a European thought process, but this is this huge argument with weapons. Mm-hmm. You know, you put a gun in somebody's hand, it can do a tremendous amount of good. It has an amazing defense deterrent it has an amazing capability to to educate blah 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 blah. Uh but that same weapon could be used for awful awful terrible things right um what have you done to help the human understand what have you done to educate them what have you done to theorize philosophize what have you done to safety up on the on the weaponry system except and what have you done to put the controls policies procedures in place Uh same thing with the technology i mean when you look at some of the stuff that's being developed, it has some amazing applications when it comes down to like cancer and Alzheimer's and everything else. Mm-hmm. But that's great until you realize we can turn around and do very, very nasty and nefarious things with it. Yeah, and it depends on the government too that, that it comes yeah. out of. Yes. The highest bidder, of course, is going to get the technology. But one thing that we're bad at as an industry is releasing things too quickly. And that's what I'm worried about. You know, something like Neuralink or, or some manipulation process. And we, yeah. we want to get it to market so quick to capitalize on it. Well, I, there we go. Capitalize on it. Bang. Fucking word. The bane of our entire industry. Uh, don't get me wrong. I have no problem putting food on the table. I have an extra health payoff and various other things. Mm. I have no issues with that. But my biggest frustration is how many billionaires we've minted. And how it's, I'm going to go into this because I'm going to make money. You know, body area networks, perfect example of that. Mm. If we could build an effective body area network, there's some amazing stuff we could do with it. But, you know, damn well, somebody's going to sit there, bring it to market half ready because they want to corner it. They want to put all the patterns on it and they want to just sit back and rake in the billions. Well, no, that's not in, that's not helping people. That's profiteering rather than protecting. Right. And I saw that in the documentary I watched the other day. I got into uh, 3D printing. And mm. they, they finally have a unit that was affordable. And I remember way back in the day when, when I first saw my first 3D printer, I think it was like $10,000. I told myself I was not going to buy one until it was affordable. And they kind of perfected the technology a little. Um, so I ended up buying an Ender 3 version 2. Yeah. It was like yeah. Two, 270 bucks. you know, pretty simple. Got one sitting in the other room. Freaking love that damn thing. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I watched this documentary about, you know, the, the creation of 3D printing and how things have progressed. And there was one company, one group of guys that, that came up with the first 
you know, Maker Lab like 3D printer that people mm-hmm. can buy and put in their house. And this other company, multi million dollar company, went out and patented everything. And here, here these guys created the very first at home 3D printer and they start going to market. They're making money, they're getting popular. The very first group of guys. And along comes this corporation and slams them with a lawsuit and try to take them out. And yeah. that, sadly, that's what our industry's like. Yeah. You know, oh, it, big it, time. Yeah. It, it kills me. Someone comes up with a good idea and they start progressing with it, but there's always a corporation or a company or somebody with money to stop that. Yeah. It's, and then the problem is, is then one person sees money. Mm-hmm. So to your point, you know, company A goes, well, you know, we've just got the patents. And then company B comes along, they, they manage to get somebody to fund them with 10, 20, 50 million on the promise that they can do it better, smarter, faster, quicker, cheaper. Then company C comes along and goes, well, we can do it with quantum. And, mm-hmm. and the poor consumer's sitting there going, which one do I buy? Which right. one's going to help me? Would you tell me you can protect me? You tell me you can protect me better. You tell me you can protect me with quantum. And, and you tell me you'll throw fucking sparkles on it at the same time. And we've got nobody independent, like truly independent, to sit there and go, they suck, they're terrible, they're not bad, and they shouldn't have been allowed out of the lunatic asylum. Exactly, exactly. It reminds me of a, a box that uh, an undisclosed company put out in the early 2000s, and it was supposed to detect any APTs in your network. So they, they bring it to the financial institution I was working at, and they're telling me about this black box. And I said, well, that's great. You know, I, I hear what you're saying, but what's under the hood? Can we take a look? Oh, no, no. It's proprietary, proprietary technology. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, so, so you have fairies in this black box that can protect me from APTs, and I'm supposed to trust you on that. Yeah. But, I mean, literally, that's how our industry, a lot of stuff gets started. Proprietary yeah. information. Oh, fucking hate that shit. I really yeah. do. This so, is, I mean, it's, you know, I'm not all for, I don't, I like the open source world, no two ways about it. I, there's there's sure. definitely a time and a place for it. There's also a time and a place to take that and go, we need to build the structure around it for various folks. So, yeah, I don't know. Well, I, I mean, you know, the open source was blamed for the solar winds attack, you know, and yeah. how they blame <laughs> you're gonna look for Jay. You're going to yeah. blame two, you're going to blame two guys from, 20, 15, 20 years ago for the problems today? Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Well, they have to find some kind of scapegoat. Who, who better to use as somebody that's open source and, you know, doesn't depend on money? Oh, no yeah. shit. I mean, it's it's terrible. I mean, it's literally like, I mean, you know, if you put up a building and the damn building burns down, are you going to go back down to the, the forestry commissioner and go, you made that tree and you made it flammable, you bastards. <laughs> what the f- I go, go sue Mother Nature at that point. I just, yeah, it, it, it's bullshit. Let's just face it. Like, yeah. So what are, your, uh, what are your predictions for 2022 as far as security goes? Ooh. Give me your top painful. five. My top five. Can we just start with painful? Okay. Um, we'll just start with painful on this one. <laughs> um, I, so mm, I'm hoping, and, and this is a bit of a, a self, self, whatever you want to call it, I'm hooked up with a, an organization that's doing, I'm, I'm going back into my Threat Intel days, like proper Threat Intel nice, stuff. So nice. I'm hanging out with some folks primarily out of Israel. I learned my lesson. I asked them more questions than the last Israeli company I worked for, for what, three months? So, and I've known Mira and a bunch of the other folks for a while. So hanging out with them and we're going to literally be doing a weekly podcast and we're going to break it up. We're going to have, and they, they, they want to call me the Dr. Dark Web. So it's going to be, we're going to have a, we're going to have some fun with it. Nice. A little tongue in cheek, hopefully not too much ego and a little bit of fun, but it's really bringing the whole idea of information and intelligence and how do you turn information into intelligence and how can you use it effectively? You know, so I'm hoping that there's elements of that gets creep into, what are we, 2022? Mm-hmm. I would hope, touch wood, that people do take a step back and talk, and go back to the simple stuff. I don't see it happening, unfortunately, but I would, I'm still going to carry on pushing that agenda of like, I, I don't need you to buy, sell me a blinky thing. I don't need anything else until, you know, this in the military world, you know, until you have situational awareness, mm. 
until you go running into that room and you know there's three bad guys, one hostage and a partridge in a pear tree, you don't go running into that room. Rarely do you go running into that room. And so if you don't know what assets you have, how the smeg do you even know what to protect, yep. let alone data and all this other stuff? So I'm hoping that that's something that we can push a lot more. Um, unfortunately, I do see a lot more of the buzzword bingo. You know, we, we have a continual ransomware issue. It, it's not going away. The, the, the bad guys have got, a, have got a really nice sniff of blood, let's face it. And so I don't see that changing. Unfortunately, I see more and more companies going, we can protect you from ransomware. At which point, you know, I'll light LinkedIn up again as I normally do. Um, I'm going to be really, really intrigued. We have the Winter Olympics coming up. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be some interesting activity, obviously, coming out of the Far East. Right. There will be a ton of scams. I mean, we just had it with Colorado. I mean, the Colorado fire happened, and literally within the first 12 hours, there are a whole bunch of scams going around about donate money. So I see that process accelerating. You know, the, the ability to take a very situational, uh, regional occurrence and then spread it out from an adversarial standpoint. I see more and more of that. So... You know, the adversaries are doing good intel gathering. So um, supply chain, I mean, you, and to me, supply chain. So I was having a conversation with somebody on uh, LinkedIn about this today. To me, supply chain means within some frame of reference, anything that's outside of your control. Right. Toilet paper being a perfect example. You know, I don't go off into the woods and walk my own tree down. I rely on some being in a shop. Well, if you're running a company, I rely on all these certain activities, all these certain processes, all this certain material. And I rely on that. And that to me is my supply chain. Mm. Um, I see that being more and more and more and more of, of a target because just like financial institutions, you don't go rob a bank anymore. It's, it's a hiding to nothing. You don't walk in the front door with a shotgun. You might get away with five, 10, 15, maybe 20,000 if you're lucky you go down and you take them out through their third party, their service provider, their card holds. And it's the same thing with, within our industry. Mm. You know, if I want to go, if I want to go take out an organization, the chances are they've probably got more money and resources than I have. So I'm going to take out the supply chain. Right. So I see a lot more of that. Um, I see it also affecting transportation a lot more. Yes. Um, that's, and um, we saw the effects of that obviously towards the end of the year with all the ships piled up outside the harbors. Mm -hmm. And so I see more and more of that occurring and maritime to give them some credit maritime is actually stepping up. There's a lot of movement in the security arena of maritime. I don't know if it's going to be enough, but there's a lot of movement. Aviation is still sitting there, you know, with its thumb up its ass. Um, quite honestly, waiting, I think, for more planes to fly into hills before they do anything. Oh, yeah. Vehicles. Yeah, vehicles are interesting ones. I don't know. We'll see. I, I think that, uh, you know, I think you're spot on when it comes to transportation. You know, I've, I've done a couple of IRs on logistics companies. Yeah. And they seem to be a high target right now for not, not just ransomware gangs, but I'm starting to see a mix of ransomware slash apt actors mm -hmm. collaborating and working oh, together yeah and, and they seem yeah they, they seem to hit those type of industries now food supply logistics oil and gas um any kind of energy sector i'm starting to see a lot more i actually saw an oil refinery um get hit with ransomware not too long ago luckily we caught it just in time before it went lateral um but I'm starting to see more and more traces of a concerted effort between groups, which is really kind of disturbing. Um, and I think you're right with the Far East, um, with China looking to take over Taiwan and flexing its muscles. Yeah. You, know, you know there's going to be sanctions behind that. And we all know what happens when we dictate sanctions and they start going after cryptocurrency. Um, that's, that's the big one. You look at that whole... I mean, okay, so admittedly, I think couple of months ago, uh, say four or five months ago, I reopened one of my cryptocurrency accounts. I hadn't messed around with it for a while. I reopened it and I started dabbling around in it. Mm -hmm. Now, again, showing age, I don't remember when I first started dabbling in this stuff, you know, there were you know, three or four to play with. 
I'm yeah. looking through the list of these bloody stupid things. Yeah. It just gets longer and longer. And, and so you're sitting there and you're like, well, hang on. I mean, we know this. You want to take over the darn thing. How many servers do they have? How many? Where's the ledger? And how do I take over more so I can manipulate this? Shit's not that hard. The math's out there right. for crying out loud. And we, we're aware of it. Let's just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. um, and so now the question then becomes as to picking and choosing which ones are likely to become more more accepted and can I manage them, control them? Can I get in early? How do I, how, how do I start influencing this stuff? And I mean, we had it years ago with the micro transactions on the stock market. Mm -hmm. We're going to see it here. I mean, you're seeing it here. The bot architectures, I was watching the frequencies of some of the transactions and it's just nuts. People are just peeling off. More. I'm sitting there. I'm like, I wouldn't mind having to go at this. And I'm like, little buddy, you don't know enough to be dangerous on this. Step away before you lose the house on the damn thing or something stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Cryptocurrency, I think it's so volatile. And yeah. What I did was I started watching the big shakers and movers, and there's no method to their madness. Like you watch Elon Musk and dumping tons of money into Bitcoin and then extracting it and starting his own cryptocurrency and kind of shutting Bitcoin out. It just, a lot of it doesn't make any sense. And I think that's what is maintaining security for them right now is it doesn't make sense. Wait and it's also it hiding losses. I have the, the problem is as well, it's hiding losses. Yeah. I was, uh, whose bloody forums was I sitting on? <laughs> I was sitting on somebody's forums. Uh, where is it? Uh, it was actually a really nice set of forums. I hadn't messed with them in a while. Uh, it was raid forums. Mm -hmm. I was sitting on raid forums and look, it was actually the Dubai stuff. They, that, they've broken into like one of the biggest uh property estate people in dubai and they were selling you know three hundred thousand people's worth of net worth on dubai uh and people who bought property and they had an entire forum it was talking about all the various different bitcoins and who's got what and i mean they're like hey we've got x amount of thousands of wallets here and tens of thousands of wallets here and we've got a whole bunch of the keys here and i'm like you know some of it you have uh, some of it you have to work at because they've they don't have maybe the private key but they've got all the other data so now you're going to have to social engineer and see what you can do or target people. But, I mean, just the amount of traffic in that space mm -hmm. at an adversarial level. It's, I don't, I just don't think we've got anywhere close to a good handle on how nasty that part of the world is. And everybody's piling into it. You know, grandma's putting her savings into Bitcoin because the kids said it was worth doing and, and poor grandma was about to get her ass handed to her again. You know, it's, she already lost it once on, you know, the love, the love, the love boat of digital buying a couple of Russian bridezillas and I, you know, get grief alive. It's just, yeah, that, that one actually scares me because so many people don't understand it. Yeah. Yeah. And absolutely. It's, and so many people, are trying yeah we none of us want to work our asses off for a living let's be honest you know if i could figure out accurately i figured out how to how to rig the powerball but if i could figure out how to rig it and get away with it right i would have done it by now because i don't want to spend that i want to work because i enjoy it not because i have to right and it's the same thing with this there are so many again humans Mm. we don't want to have to get up at seven, eight, nine o'clock in the morning to work for the next 50, 60 years. If I can basically go make my money in six months or three weeks on a couple of these get rich quick versions of uh, digital currency, everybody's flocking to it. And it, it's, there's only a few people who are going to make money on it and it's going to be your money they're making. Yeah, exactly. And then when you look at the uh, NFTs and, and digitizing Ooh, people, oy, that's, they. that's another no. interesting topic. <laughs> Okay, you, <laughs> I got dragged in to do a little bit of consultation with a, a gallery out of uh, the East Coast mm -hmm. um, who was uh, wanting to help some of their clients with NFTs and various other things. And it was definitely an eye-opening conversation uh, and one that both intrigued and scared me at the same time. Because again, so many people have no clue. And then how do you enforce it? How do you manage it? How do you protect it? How do you contain it? How do you control it? How do you... I'm just waiting for the Mona Lisa to be NFT. That's all I'm after. And then I'm going after that. I I, I want digital rights to, to Mona, bless her. 
Well, th- there was, I can't remember her name, but there was somebody on Twitter who woke up one morning, I believe it was last week, to a picture of herself that was an NFT. And she was pissed. She wanted to, you know, take it down. She wanted to revoke, you know, yeah. and, and with, with all, with all, you know, right to do so, you know, but like that risk you're talking about, you know, that's, that's what we're facing now. Yeah. Anything can be an NFT now. Oh yeah. It's, it's, um, it's, it's interesting. I'm, uh, I know enough of that to be pretty dangerous on it. But and I think you know this is this is where it gets really interesting for for us. You know we, we've <sighs> ethics. Let's talk ethics and morals for a second, which lacks in our industry quite a bit. <laughs> and it's uh, truthfully, it's getting harder. Uh, when you think about it, so we go back. Let's go back ten years. 10, 10, 10 15 years. Mm. If you or I were like, sod it, I'm done playing the nice guy. I, I'm done. We would have gone on one of our pen tests, the hard drive that contained all of the financial records that we just relieved our client of wouldn't have gone back to the client. We would have just dissipated off to the middle of fuck fuck nowhere and and enjoyed ourselves. Right. But that was work and it was effort and it was time and it was planning and, 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 and. Mm -hmm. Today, you look at how easy it would be to go off the rails. Right. It's so much easier. I mean, the temptation's there. The ease of doing it is there. The ability to get away with it is has probably been no easier. Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 and you're sitting there and you're like, you can understand why our industry is in the state it's in is because you look at the mess that the world is in when it comes to the digital world and you're like, I can make real easy money by not doing much and I don't have to make a difference and well, I'll deal with it. You know, and, and it's... It's tough. It's it's really tough. Yeah, I think that morals and ethics, that, that's one thing that I think any of us security researchers have battled with at one point. Mm-hmm. You know, doing something for a client that maybe was against our ethics. Like I had one client that wanted results changed because they weren't going to pass their audit. Um, you know, and that falls in that same category. Do you, you know, do you yeah. take that extra money and, and change those results or do you live by the code of ethics? Yeah, And, you know, I've, I've always stayed really close to that line of, of ethics, made sure, you know, to dot my, dot my I's and cross my T's because of my background. You know, I, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't want to be one of those people who is suspected and thrown in jail, but there are people in our industry that would not hesitate to violate those ethics and go back down that road. Oh, yeah. um, you know, I've seen a lot of that, especially like starting a podcast and everything and having more people talking to me and and reaching out to me. I've seen a lot of questionable ethics when it comes to that. Um, Well, that's, uh, so this is, I mean, you, again, you talk about it the way, this is the, when I went in to go hang out with uh, the Cisco folks, it was uh definitely the conversation was, look, if I'm coming in to help, how are we doing this properly? How are we putting, you know, I look at Evan and Ryan, how are we putting mission before money? Mm -hmm. Yes, again, you've got to put food on the table, you've got to pay back the investors, blah, 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 blah. But how do we do it in a way where I can look at you and I can look at others in the industry and go, hey, I did it the best way I could. Right. And I'm not doing it as an excuse. I'm actually standing up tall while I'm doing that. Um, and so we had some amazing conversation. That's part of the reason I left the, the previous bunch of Israeli folks was because when you're told at like one, two o'clock in the morning, while well, everybody else lies, we are okay doing it. And it was those exact words. I'm like, wow. And I'm out of here. <laughs> There's the exit. Yeah. And it literally was, it was like 48 hours later, it was talking to the owner and saying, I'm done. Yeah. I had a, I had a interesting uh, situation like that back in 2010, 2011, worked for a uh, intelligence company. And they were doing some very questionable things, like putting people in countries where they're wanted and then cutting off ties and communications with them. Uh, a lot of crazy stuff. But the weird thing was it was government condoned. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, those are the scary ethics that, that I danced with. And I left. I was like, you know, I, I can't sleep at night. There's no way that I can live with myself knowing this stuff is going on. So let somebody else deal with it. Yeah. But this year, I think that... I think geopolitics is going to play a bigger role in our industry. And with what happens, 
I guess, you know, in technology and, and on the internet. I think that with the Cold War with China and Russia still going on uh, on the internet, I think we're going to see some cyber arms races and it, I think we're going to see it visibly. I think we're talking carrier level. Um, you know, it, it, hopefully it won't come true, but you know, knowing the geopolitics between you know, the U.S. and these, these various countries and the way that some of the groups, the APT groups, I put that in air quotes because I, I'm yeah. not even sure what APT means anymore, to be honest with you. Um, you know, every, it seems like every group that has national pride becomes an APT at some point. Oh, my gosh, yeah, tell me about it. And everybody wants their own fucking code word. I mean, it's literally like the little clicky cub. Yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't want to release my advance. I don't want to release my exploit unless I get I get a website that goes with it. I'm, I'm, I mean, seriously, it's like, really? You want a fucking badge of honor or something? Congratulations, you figured out a four. Guess what? There's billions of fucking things. Get off your fucking high horse. How about fix it for five minutes? Yeah, I, I think everybody's in a race to get the, the cool CrowdStrike uh logo of an apt and apt named after you with a cartoon character i think that's cool shit um that yeah. <laughs> that was the best uh, marking that i've seen in a long time but i do think that i think we're going to see a political issue geopolitics play into internet security more this year um and i think a lot of that comes from the current administration first of all trying to put into effect uh where a company gets breached and they have 72 hours to report it um, first of all, that's not, that's not short enough. Second of all, there's no way that that, that will ever go. Um, but, but they're making strides in the right path, the right direction. But I think that ransomware and some of the uh, targets that they're hitting, I think we're going to see some, some switches being flipped. And we're actually going to see a, a massive effect at some point this year. Well, that's okay. So go back to that, the government thing and the 72 hours. I mean, that was, you know, Europe did that with the GDP yeah. side of things. And I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's been, a, a, I would argue, mm -hmm. and that's otherwise a, an abject failure. Because you've got almost every company in Europe had to put their hand up and go, yeah, we've got our ass to send it to us. And the folks that are meant to be implementing the, the, the fine structures and the, re, the remediation blah, blah, and all this stuff, they haven't got enough bandwidth. I mean, they're still so backlogged; it's ridiculous. So, so, and at which point, why the hell am I putting my hand up? Yeah, you know. Exactly. I, and, and then, then now, and so now you've got uh, now you got the lawyers. Well, was it actually a breach? Well, can you prove it? Where is the data? Can we've had this for years? We had it with PCI. It's like, well, do I have to declare a breach? I don't know. Can you find the data on the darker side of the net? No, you motherfucker. I saw it leave your internet. Well, that doesn't mean there's actually a breach. It might have just gone out there, and and then nobody will ever use it. Well, I. Oy vey, you know, and so I, that frustrates, and again, I think the other part of that problem is going to be no different. Again, we're humans. Right. We already are, I mean, it's, I was actually, while we were talking, I was actually, I brought up a ZDNet's article mm -hmm. on the breaches, on the breaches, the worst breaches from 2021. And I'm looking through this, and I can remember most of these, but there are some in here that I didn't remember hearing about, let alone was like, oh, I forgot about that one. Now, when you're forgetting about a breach involving 45 million people, there's something wrong. Yep. We've become so immune, so blasé, so... The problem is we've uh, accepted it. That's we the problem. There we go, yeah. It's mass acceptance. And because we're, you know, we've been exposed and subjected to it for so long yeah. that it's not an issue anymore. Nobody looks at it as an issue. Privacy, take privacy, for instance. How long have we been battling privacy issues? You know, right. not just people exposing our, our details and our, our information, but look at the government and how the government deals with privacy. You know, and, and we allow it. We allow it. Right. Sure, I'll sign up for that. Oh, that, that smart device? Oh, you want to take logs from it every day? Sure, not a problem. Yeah. You know, as long as I <laughs> as long as I have the convenience of using it, take all my shit. Was it was it 21 or was it 20 when the FBI suddenly came up and said, Hey, hope you don't mind, but we've been rifling it around inside the company just to help them out. <laughs> to, to, to to shore up your weaknesses. Sure. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that was oh. it. That was this past year. 
That was a special. That was it. Was yeah. That was the um, and, and what happened? Everybody's like, oh, yeah, I'm a little bit of uproar, and everybody's like, oh, no problem. I'm like, <laughs> are you fucking serious? The feds just walked into your place, uninvited, ruffled around, sorted a few things out, helped you out, and then buggered off, and then told you. That's worse than them picking up the phone. I remember you've probably done the same thing. I remember the breaches where the company would get the phone call from the feds going, hi, we're, you're part of a compromise. We're watching your server and all this data leaving. Would you mind leaving it on for another couple of days? <laughs> Fuck off, click. <laughs> So worse, worse, worse than that. Um, I know a company who the FBI contacted and said, "Hey, you're on a hit list, and this is this is a threat actor. This is what they're doing. You know, we just wanted to let you know you're on a hit list." So you know, people are gearing up. People are looking at defenses. They weren't on a hit list. They had already been hit, and the FBI watched it occur oh, without I telling. Yeah. Yes, without telling them. Yeah. They even had a, a intelligence report and analysis yeah. of the breach from what was that? I think it's called 2B or, or B1 or, or some, some bullshit like that. It's a foreign intelligence company. Yeah. And they literally had a report, a 20-page document on how they got breached and didn't tell them until afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, people I just, want that we don't trust some of uh, our federal authorities. I mean, it's uh, actually his. This is, and this you know, goes back to research. This is the other thing I think, which is one of those kind of dilemmas to some degree. And I, I talked about it. Uh, I was on a on a conversation the other day, and I remember this conversation, which is, let's say you discover another flaw in the Apple device. Uh -huh. um, what do you do? Do you call up Apple and go, "Hey, you got a problem"? They, they either accept it or they don't accept it. Depends upon who it is you've got a hold of, what part of the bug bounty, whether you're going to get a couple of grand or not out of it. Right. Do you contact the government and go, hey, i got to weigh into every single iPhone, at which point one of a couple of things happen. The little boys turn up and it just gets taken away from you or they write you a check and say thank you and shut up and never mention it again. Or do you go to the open market and make a billion? Yeah. Or do you go onto an online forum, a public forum, pick a LinkedIn, Facebook and go, Hey, here's a problem. You all got to deal with it. So, um, so a yeah. person that I know that I'm close to actually does that. Jonathan Scott. Yeah. And oh, he did yeah. it. He did it with Apple. Yeah. And Apple said it was a feature. Yeah. There we go. I, and that, so at which point you're like, you know, do I just kiss my pay gig goodbye? Do I say, do I feel good about it? Do I now feel pissed off at Apple and now we'll never talk to them again? Yeah. I've seen that. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, and that I mean, happens all where, the time. Yeah, I've used, I've worked with um, Bug and Hack a couple of times mm -hmm. on a few things behind the scenes with a couple of us who worked on a couple of projects together. And we've you know, we got a couple of couple of grand out of each one and all that kind of good stuff. But it's still, you know, it's like, hang on, we make the software that goes into place, we charge you for that money. Then we find the flaws in the software and we charge you for that money. Then when the software breaks, you charge you for that money. Then we charge you to replace it. We charge, this is racketeering. <laughs> yeah, right. And that's basically what they did to him. You know, he went to Apple and said, hey, you know, look, you have this issue. First of all, they, they ignored the issue. And then yep. they came back and fought the relevance of the issue. Yep. And I mean, it showed how Apple basically got all of your data, your health data, all that shit. And it, you know, privacy, nobody cares about privacy anymore. You know, it, when you look at the smart devices, we all know where the information goes. We all know that, yeah. that Amazon listens 24 seven through all their devices. You know, it, it's right. not, it's not a shock. Um, oh, but, 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 but it's, to, it's to improve the service right. that you are receiving from us. <laughs> right, exactly. But that's where we are in 2021 and 2022. Yeah. Can you believe that shit? It, I was thinking about this the other day. When I look back to when I first got in technology, late 90s, same company as Jason Street. We worked at Software Support Inc. in downtown Houston. Yeah. And looking back then, if you were to tell me that we would have all these devices in our homes, listening to everything we did and reporting everything back to a big tech company, I would have said, man, you've been watching way too much sci-fi. But here it is. And it's, it's fact. It's reality. I'll have to find it. Um, there was a, a good friend of mine from the Washington DC area sent me uh, a comic and it was a, a one, a one strip thing. 
and it was it was two intelligence operatives from like the 1940s or whatever talking about you know what they would love to have had these days and the next one was you know the next one was basically you know Alexa and Google devices just recording everything and it's it was a beautiful comic I got to find it and he sent it to me he's like do you remember those days I'm like oh hell I mean we were light bulbs I just finished doing some research on light bulbs I'm gonna have to have to publish it at some point oh yes oh much fun yeah, I mean, yeah. remember the days when we were figuring out how to listen in on those stupid things using lasers for crying out loud. Yep. And now, nowadays, I mean, good grief, the down things, we just have to sit back, put our feet up and just listen. But here's the problem is we're so busy defending the new technology that most of the industry has forgotten about the old technology, RF. Yeah. How, how many companies protect themselves against RF? None. Oh, I'll go one. I'll go one better than that. I we were, we were breaking into somewhere the other week. Um, it's one of the last ones I'm going to do. I'm actually probably not going to do any more pen testing unless it's because I want to. I'm mm -hmm. done with doing it for companies. But we're doing one the other week, and I ran across a modem. And I'm digging out. I actually have it over there. I've got my Dell, my old Dell, like old Dell, that mm -hmm. still has the the modem card in it. And I'm oh, trying to remember. <laughs> programs for dialing up this shit we get, the, we get into the modem the modem's hooked up to one of the back end systems and we're just like poof, straight in and you're like buddies welcome to the 1980s they just owned you welcome to war dialing oh yeah. my gosh that's one of the reasons I first got yelled at in this industry for goodness sakes oh yeah so before we go new year's resolutions for 2022 so I've actually got a couple. I, I put them up on, uh, I put a post out the other day. Uh, one of them actually is uh, no more pen testing. Uh, I will not do any more pen testing. I, I will maybe put a poke ahead in every now and again, but I'm done doing it. And I'm done really with HHS doing any more pen tests. We've got two we're wrapping up and after that I'm done. I am I am fed up to the back teeth of, of telling people 10 different ways, 20 different ways, how we've broken into them. I've had enough. I, I'm having some good conversations with folks going, look, you know we're going to get in. You know this is happening. Let's have that conversation. Right. So that's one. Uh, one of the other one, honestly, is to get back on the bandwagon with uh, with weight. I dropped 25, 30 pounds. And then the problem is, is December went to hell in the handbasket. And I put like 10 pounds back on. So I was kind of pissed at myself. So overall, 21, lost 25. This year, 22, I want to do the same thing, lose another 25. So that's really another big one for me. Um, from a tech standpoint, I want Dave. I want Dave. We've done some really cool things with Dave, uh, which is the little device to look after like small, small companies, two, three person companies up to no more than like 25 to 50. Right. I want Dave working and I want it out there much more, much more so than it is. I want to spend some time on it, yada, yada, yada. Cool. Uh, that's a big one for me. Um, there are a couple of other things that were on there as well. Uh, yeah, but it, it's really just to take a step back and actually, honestly, one of the big ones, I mean, you run into this as well as I do, which is like, hey, we'd love to have you travel out to this conference. Mm -hmm. And then, then there's that silent pause. Right. And I'm like, okay, so, and, and then I'm like, okay, why do I have to be the one that goes, who's paying for travel? Who's paying for this? Who's paying for this? Well, I'm taking two or three days out. Who's picking up the tab for that? Because I don't have Big Daddy Warbucks behind the scenes who's paying me for all this shit. This is out of my pocket. Right. And so I'm being a lot more, I guess, militant mm -hmm. with my time and where it's spent. This kind of stuff I freaking love because I can hang out, I've got the dogs, whatever. But if you're asking me to jump on an airplane with another 160 diseased people and sit there with a freaking face mask on for God knows how many hours while everybody else around you is half face masking, is, you know, the face masks down here or it's up here or they yell quit that shit, I'm done with that. Unless you're paying yeah. me money, I'm not doing that shit. So, yeah, being a little bit more militant with time is, is another big one for me. Yeah, I think uh, for mine, for mine, it was one, I want to be more healthy this year. Um, yeah. Stay away from bad habits and, and you know, the normal resolutions. Um, but more on the tech side, I want to learn something new every day. I think mm -hmm. sometimes I get to a place where I get stagnant. And I, I, I get complacent, I think. Um, so one of my um, new projects was actually getting the 3D printer and, and learning yeah. how to do that. And there's all kinds of area for improvement there. Um, and luckily, uh, TechStrong, who you know, rebroadcast the, the podcast, yeah. they've, been, they've been outstanding, man. 
um, they, like you said, like, you know, air, air flight and hotels, all that's paid for. They've been nice. really good about having me talk at conferences. And uh, this year, I think I'm going to be doing workshops for them and teaching people how to hack Ooh, different things. Fantastic. Oh, that's really good news. That's actually fantastic news. So getting back to the, to the grassroots of, you know, helping people and, and teaching people. Yeah. That's, um, that's part of the reason for doing the ones we're doing on a weekly basis and some other stuff yeah. like the shit show stuff that we do on the podcast. Yeah. It's just, it's like, Hey, I need people. I, there's more people. We need more good people. And yeah. how do we, how do we help that? How do we get more people in yeah. And how do we help those that are already in actually, how do we run cover fire for them in essence? Yeah. So, and, and that brings up a good point too. Uh, one of my other resolutions was helping more people in the industry get their voice out. Um, and I've made friends with a, an awesome dude, uh, Dr. Gerald Osher. And I had him on the podcast. I'll be on his podcast in February. And his community that he's built around Simply Cyber is absolutely fucking amazing. The people nice. are great. There's never any cross words. There's no, you know, flexing. It, I mean, it's just a great fucking community. And nice. my goal is to build my community more like that. Nice. Um, but the hard part is coming from the backgrounds we come from, there's always going to be that noise. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I think for this year, I'm going to pay less attention to the noise and more attention to, getting the word out and, and teaching companies that you don't need fucking AI or ML. You need to understand your environment. Yeah. That's uh, there's some stuff I'm doing. There's a group out there called flyover future uh, flyover mm -hmm. and they focus Midwest. They're, they, they're really not. I think mean, they've got people on the East and West coast, but they're all Midwest and it's all smaller companies and organizations. Mm -hmm. Um, and some amazing folks in there and same thing. I'm just helping them out. Uh, I'm sitting on Slack channels and it's cool. It's, I like the Midwest folks. They're nice. Yeah. They're civilized. You know, it's yeah. although <laughs> somebody, I was talking to somebody the other day, and they're like, "We know the saying around here." I'm like, "No." They're like, "Shoot, shovel, and silence." I'm like, "Ooh, oh, I like that." That's and then you suddenly realize like there's a lot of freaking open space in that neck of the woods. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. I, I spent most of my childhood in the Midwest, so. I know all about the the cornfields. Welcome the to having bonfires. a great day. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, I really appreciate you being on the show as usual. It's not really even a show when when I have you on. It's more of like a you know sit down, let's have a chit chat. You know? Yeah, and that, I that's it. what I enjoy. It's so how it should be. Yeah, it's yeah. so how it should be. Can I finish up with Mike for a second? You goofball. <laughs> this is why you know you see me wearing the paracord bracelets. Oh, and yeah. It's only partly from a military remembrance standpoint. The other part of it is because I've got a 160 pound dog that wants to hang off my arm. <laughs> and a big one too. Yeah, for sure. Oh, well, man, take care of yourself. Take care of your you family. Too, take care of the dogs. And yes. uh, if you need anything, I'm a phone call away. And Deal. again, man, I can't, I can't thank you enough for being on the show. No, this is, as you said, this isn't, this is just hanging out. This is how it should be. All right, man. We'll take care and I'll talk to you, you soon. You too. Right. Take care, bro. Bye bye.